Deep within the Segmentum Pacificus, to the galactic west of Holy Terra, an event known as the War of the False Primarch saw the 33rd millennium plunged into war. Little is known about the true events of this conflict, being a minor footnote in Games Workshop's expansive history of the Warhammer 40k universe, but not all has been lost to the ravages of time and censure. While the identity of the False Primarch is unknown, they succeeded in rousing chaos and rebellion in the Sector, biting back against the hand of the Greater Imperium. The High Lords of Terra saw fit to task the Adeptus Astartes in the suppression of the False Primarch and inducted five Space Marine chapters into a holy fraternity dubbed the Pentarchy of Blood. The Carcharodons, the Flesh Eaters, the Red Talons, the Death Eagles, and the Charnel Guard saw to the sector running red with traitor blood over the next 80 years, eventually leading to the False Primarchs slain and their name purged from history itself. In this video series, I'll be going into the five chapters of the Pentarchy of Blood, some being more famous in the eyes of the fandom, and some a little more obscure. Today, we'll be concluding the Pentarchy of Blood series with the Angel's maroon-headed stepchildren, the Charnel Guard. We are finally at the last chapter of the Pentarchy of Blood. We've covered the Sneaky Sharks, the Hungry Hungry Hippos, the Redacted, and the Aggressively Loyal, and now it's time to talk about the Zombies. Technically, the second Blood Angel's successor we've talked about in this series, the Charnel Guard have been a highly requested chapter to showcase here on the channel. One of you fuckers has even asked me multiple videos ad infinitum like it's your day job or something, so without further ado, let's shut this guy up for good. Stop it. Get some help. The Charnel Guard are Blood Angel's successors, although when and where they spawn from is currently unknown. Many people suspect their birth to be sometime during the Third Founding, which makes them littermates with chapters such as the Executioners and the Size of the Emperor. No, not the size, the Scythe of the Emperor. They sport a black and maroon uniform, cementing the Pentarchy of Blood as a real black and red crowd until someone throws in the Retro Death Eagles flashbang. Like many Blood Angel successors, their Gene C defects include the Black Rage and the Red Thirst, but members of the Charnel Guard are known to resemble corpses, pale and gaunt skin with eyes glazed over. They grow long, fanged canines and their breath smells of rotting flesh, giving the Charnel Guard a ghoulish appearance. While the origins of their first chapter master, Zephan, the bringer of sorrow, can be directly traced to their parent legion during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy, the Charnel Guard are not considered part of the Sanguinary Brotherhood, leaving them unacknowledged heirs of Sanguinius' legacy, despite most definitely having his gene seed. Zephon himself had been present to weep over Sanguinius' body after Horus totally dubstepped him. Yet the Greater Brotherhood is coy with their relationship with them for no discernible reason. Due to the extremely reclusive nature of this chapter, it makes you wonder if being outcast is the cause or the effect of their exclusion from the Brotherhood uh, it has nothing to do with the fact that they look like walking corpses with SMGs. No, 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 no. There's, there's obviously something more to it. You'd think the Charnel Guard would be shitting and crying about being kept out of the glorious Vampire VIP Club, but funnily enough, the Charnel Guard have been inducted into many a random alliance over their years, making them shockingly popular to seemingly everyone except the Sons of Sanguinius. Of course, they are a member of the Pentarchy of Blood, obviously, because they are in my video series. But one fraternity they participated in was during the Great Malagantine Purge. Within the Segmentum Tempestus, heretics were stomping around in the Malagant sector. The Charnel Guard were inducted into the Manus Eri, translated to the Hands of Wrath, five Space Marine chapters tasked with the complete genocide of the sector. Uh, kind of getting deja vu here. Out of the five chapters, the names of two have either been lost to time or censured, leaving the only known members of this alliance listed as the Charnel Guard, the Silver Skulls, and the Firehawks. Seeing as the Manus Eerie have been assembled by the High Lords of Terra themselves, again, deja vu, to pass their judgment upon the Maligant Sector, 
the Inquisition themselves wouldn't be able to get access to those records even if they wanted to, meaning the names of the final two chapters will probably stay lost to time. Uh, unless I fill them in myself. HA! The Charnel Guard were also assembled to participate in the Angevin Crusade, which I lightly touched upon in my Carcaridons video. Alongside an overwhelming presence of Imperial Guard, Imperial Navy, and Titan Legions, the Charnel Guard were tasked with the early expansion in what would become known as the Calixus Sector. The Black Templar, Tigers Argent, and Sons of Medusa were their Astartes allies in this task, making them an important part of the Sector's early history. The Charnel Guard are also members of the Triarchy, an alliance between the Charnel Guard, Angels Numinous, and the Red Seraphs. While this alliance was so deep that they even had their cool kid clubhouse password to start off their meetings with, it's noted that the other two chapters rarely saw eye to eye on most issues brought before the Triarchy, leaving the Charnel Guard forced to play mediator most of the time. One of their most notable alliances is probably being a member of the infamous Maelstrom Warders, the group of space marines tasked with guarding the Maelstrom who later tried to secede from the Imperium in the Badab War. This group were the Charnel Guard, Lamenters, of course, and Mantis Warriors under the command of the Astral Claws. Before the days of secession, when the Warders functioned as intended, the Charnel Guard were one of the two chapters tasked with striking at the Renegade Legions deep within the Maelstrom, the first Imperial effort to do so. They were partnered with their fellow Lamenters, an oddly appropriate alliance given their oddball status within the Sanguinary Brotherhood. As what was known as the Scourge Campaign raged on with success, the Charnel Guard were suddenly pulled from the Crusade and reassigned to the Thanatos Crusade. This command was given from Holy Terra itself, leaving the Charnel Guard with little choice but to comply, allowing them to avoid having their loyalty called into question when the Badab War broke out. Most importantly, it left the Lamenters to do what the Lamenters do best. Now while I really could keep going, as I haven't even touched on Zephon and his weird-ass Build-A-Bear cybernetic bizarre adventures featuring John Landraider, I hope I've got my point across here. The Charnel Guard are a pretty popular chapter, somehow called into multiple alliances in-universe despite looking pretty similar to what they are purging most of the time. These days, the Charnel Guard focus their operations within the Imperium Nihilus after the Great Rift split Imperial territory in two. Given that Lord Commander Dante of the Blood Angels was placed in charge of the Dark Imperium, yet they don't really see eye to eye with the Charnel Guard, it makes you wonder if the Guard saw to assisting their parent legion out of duty or maybe to coax favor from the Lord. After all, the decision to do so was a group decision made by the Triarchy, but maybe they were in the area when the Great Rift opened and it just happened to work out due to locational convenience. Or maybe Dante just told the Triarchy to fucking do it and they were like, well, what are we gonna say, no? <laughs> yeah, try that out, see how it works for you guys. Building the Charnel Guard was fairly straightforward. I chose to use this Stern Guard veteran from the Leviathan box set, uh, specifically this guy. At this point, I've looted more models from Leviathan than I've actually built, but uh, yeah, whatever. In this batch of models, we don't have a nice power weapon yet, so I wanted to have a nice heroic pose with blade drawn. I had a resin copy of this lieutenant, which includes this power sword bit I'm not going to use, so I stole it from my Charnel boy here. I attached it with some super glue, uh, because plastic glue doesn't really do much to resin. Uh, I think that's by design. <laughs> uh, as for the left arm, I stole this plasma pistol arm from a spare sprue of hell blasters I got in an eBay lot and used it as is. So this here is a Blood Angel style jump pack that I 3D printed off of Colts 3D. I actually do have just regular Assault Squad jump packs available, but since I was printing these pauldrons and some other stuff, I figured I'd spend an extra buck or two to get a nice jump pack, you know, while I had the printer set up. 
If you don't have access to a 3D printer, you could totally loot the infamously god-tier Sanguinary Guard Kit, but getting hold of this chapter's pauldrons may be a little harder. I put a link in the description for a place to buy some STLs on the cheap, but the printerless folk in the crowd will probably have to troll around Etsy or ask a friend for the hookup. Speaking of pauldrons, I picked up this flamboyant-ass Angel Pauldron STL online as well. It's a recreation of a pauldron that already exists, but since I had the printer up, you know, it was cheaper and faster to just print it. And again, STLs are in the description. Now while my plan was to just use this Sternguard's Mark VII helmet that he came with, I wanted to gussy it up a little bit. So I found this iron halo in one of my bits boxes and chopped it up to fit over the head. It's not exactly a Blood Angel's helmet, but I think it invokes the vibe. Uh, also I know this was the perfect opportunity to use a bare head and show off their ghoulish visage, but uh, I, I kind of forgot about it. Um, I got really excited about sticking the iron halo to the helmet and I just completely forgot. Uh, sorry chief, it be how it be. Alright so I have to preface the painting section with something. The Charnel Guard have an established color palette, as shown here on this Dreadnought. However, they don't have an established color distribution for their Marines. They've got the colors, but not where they go. For me, I'm going to try to match the Dreadnought with the Maroon on the Pauldrons, Knee Guards, and just as a little bit of leadership flair, the Helmet. The Dreadnought also has red lenses but I personally didn't like how the red blended into the maroon of the helmet, so I did change the eye lenses to an icy blue down the line, uh, which also tied the color into the energy effects of the power sword and the plasma pistol. I did also mean to put this icy blue energy effect into the thruster of the power pack, but uh, I forgot, so let's move on. In this obscure lore series, I've painted a lot of black armor. Like, a lot of black armor. Like most of my black armored minis that have come before, the Charnel Guard started from a coat of black primer. On top of this, I laid a base coat of dark gray to act as my black layer, as this will give me better color depth in the recesses of the armor when I put a wash on it all later. The dark gray gets dry brushed with a neutral gray, then a sky gray on the most extreme points and edges. When it comes to selecting these spots for Mark 10 armor, I usually try to hit the top of the helmet, the collar, the upper part of the pauldrons and the trim, uh, kneecaps, fingers, and the toes. The toe may seem like an odd spot to define, but depending on your basing scheme, it can really help define the feet on a cluttered base. With the 27th Quintillionth Power Armor I've painted in a good spot, I start to layer on the red, or more specifically, maroon. Maroon is commonly confused with burgundy, and rightfully so, but the general tip between these mixes is that maroon is a reddy brown, while burgundy is a purpley red. I mixed a brown into my red and got to base coating the head, the pauldron fields, the kneecaps, and the big old angel wings. With all the base coatings for the maroon done, I used more poster tack to protect the black parts of the model from some dry brush highlights, which are just achieved with adding white into the maroon. I managed to get some pretty smooth highlights overall, and uh, I was pretty happy with it, so on to the next step. For the random bits and bobs on the armor, I used a variety of colors. I used a sky gray on the tabard so I could put a small highlight of white on the raised areas. That same sky gray was used to quickly base coat the purity seals. With the plan down the line to tint them brown with a brown wash. White would have been a little bit better for this job, but this sky gray covered in like two coats. Uh, so it was very easy, didn't have to fuss with it at all. I also used a dark and neutral brown to pack out all of the leather bits like the holster. These could have stayed black, but if the armor is black, I like using brown to help differentiate it. 
With the bobs done, I break out that mithril blade to base coat the metals. I wrestled with the idea of where to put any gold on the mini, as the blood angels and their kin are known to be very gold and gaudy. However, not only did the scheme just kind of look better to me without the small gold ornamentations, but I like to think that it kind of helps set them apart as outcasts with their gene family. This was, however, not an original idea, as that logic was part of my decision to do almost the same thing for a custom chapter I made years ago for Kill Team, The Angel's Lament. You should, uh... Go, go check them out after this if you're not bored. I really like them, but you know, you ain't got it. That's cool. Whatever. I'm just gonna cry. When it came to washing the entire mini, I decided to use a diluted purple wash. In this case, Druki Violet, for multiple reasons. The Charnel Guard are stated to have black armor akin to volcanic glass. Looking on Google, my favorite references for volcanic glass were almost a deep purple. And I thought it would be cool to tint my black armor to suggest that. Also, the purple shade just looked really cool over that silver. It did have the side effect of pushing my maroon towards burgundy, but eh, honestly, it's not too bad. I could have just not washed those sections or hit them with a brown later, but the color wasn't altered too much at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, fuck it. All that was left was to paint the base, give it a rim job, and call it done. I uh, know down the line I'm going to regret saying rim job, but uh, whatever, I'm in it already. I love, love, love how this mini turned out in general. The highlights with the dry brush are so smooth, and the maroon just pops on this black field. Everything about it, man, it just works. It may not be my personal favorite of the batch, but in terms of execution and technique, this is just superb. Like, <laughs> man, I knocked it out of the park with these dry brushes. With no concrete scheme though, there are a multitude of ways you could interpret the coloring of this chapter. But uh, you could easily use something like this as a baseline if you weren't looking to do anything funky with it. But uh, yeah, I think it works. Uh, it's pretty much a direct copy of that Dreadnought, almost a one-for-one. One. But hey, when you're extrapolating a color uniform out of a source material, sometimes, you know, it's not super flashy. But anyways, I hope you guys like it as much as I do, and hopefully this will satiate that one bastard who haunts my comment section like a bad itch. Since the last video, we've had a couple new patrons join, um, kind of all on the same day, too. Uh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't really expecting that, but I wanted to give a thanks to you guys real quick. Thank you to Zoe Monroe, Tech Scrolls, Mercurian Temple, Joshua Welt, and Spencer. All the support that you guys have been showing me is, really means a lot to me. And thank you to my patrons, and thank you to everybody just watching the video. Really, I, like, you don't need to be a patron. My content will always be free. But that doesn't mean I appreciate you guys any less, you know. It's just there's one of me and like 12,000 of you guys, you know. So, I mean, I would love to try to sit here and read through a list of them all, but, uh, you know, I'd probably die. <laughs> but yeah, thank you to all you guys for watching. Thank you for my patrons. If you like what I do here on the channel, and if you liked the Pentarchy of Blood series, I'd really appreciate any kind of interaction you'd like to give me, whether it's a comment or a subscription, whatever it is, even if it's just a view, thank you. Looking at the recent work on the channel, we've had a lot of Space Marines in general, either Loyalist or Chaos. Next time, I think we'll try to get a little bit away from them, just as a bit of a breather, you know. Don't get me wrong, I love some hot sweaty dudes in metal, but you know, it's, it's good to take a break every once in a while. Until that video comes out though, feel free to watch whatever is posted on screen here. Um, or not, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to force you. Thank you again, and I hope you have a good one.